Yeah. No, no controller is sitting there looking at the clock going, okay, he's going to start his approach in 45 seconds. None. Zero. That is not happening. He's, he's looking at the scope going, go away. Get off of my scope. Land somewhere. I don't even care where. Just go away. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200 frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike Clear Visual Truck Runway 23 Left Connect Hour. November 3222 Yankee Area of Heavy to Extreme Precipitation 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock 15 miles 7 Radiant miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie Try a departure with our contact climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima Reduce speed to 180. You're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk via fire, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Trun Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. Clear to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special. Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Trun Alpha, this is Triad Approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, December 5th, 2022, episode 257. On today's show, we'll talk about getting instrument currency with multiple airports along your flight plan, settling back in after a break, and more of your awesome aviation questions and feedback. What's up, baby? Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Saturday before this releases. Yay. Yay. (laughs) Uh, it's been like two plus weeks since we recorded a show. It feels like a long time. Mm-hmm. Bear with us while we remember, try to remember what to do next. <laughs> How yes. have you been for the last two weeks? Now you can actually tell us about your Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was fantastic. Um, it was a first ever to have. Mm. So my parents, the in-laws... Uh, all in one place. Mm. The last time I think that happened was at our <clears throat> wedding. So almost 15 years ago. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was good. Um, excellent food. And then some time passed, and then I broke my back. <laughs> <laughs> it's not broken, but I am hurting. Uh, it's my biannual back event, I call it. Mm. Uh, yesterday when I went to, when I was at the doctor and she came in and said, you know, what's going on? I said, oh, it's just my biannual back event. And she goes, oh, how long has that been going on? I said, about 20 years. (laughs) (laughs) She said, oh, how are we treating it? (laughs) I said, just give me some steroids. Send me on my way. Wait, that's all you got to do to go ask for those? Got it. it. That's it. Ah, my back hurts. Give me some steroids. I have not had a back injury like yours, but I have had issues occasionally. Well, not occasionally, maybe every few years. And when your back is out, you're done. Yeah, it's kind of an important part <laughs> of your body. I think that's why they call it the core. You know, <laughs> the core. <laughs> yeah. That's why we moved from Thursday to allow you time to get adequate treatment. I could not on Thursday, Friday. It's it's ma- it's manageable today. I could not sit. Mm. Sitting was the worst thing mm. to do. There's no way I could have sat through a show. Mm-mm. Thursday, it was bad, bad. I flew an airplane in our time off. Oh, you did. Mm-hmm. Uh, patron Juliet Hotel and I took a club Skyhawk. 
Not the one with the worst call sign ever, I don't think. The one that we took. I think it was a different one. We took it to the west near, well, north of Metroplex. Had lunch and came back. Got a little courtesy in the logbook. Flight following from Triad. I don't think they knew who it was who was flying. They didn't they ask didn't me know. weird weird questions. Sorry, I'm passing notes. That's <laughs> no, okay. Um, Thanksgiving was good. We went to family's house, and I did not have the midnight shift like I thought I was going to have to have that night. Hmm. I moved to a day shift. So the day after Thanksgiving was pretty slow at work. The weekend I heard was not. Yesterday I got crushed at work. It's yeah, not, it's not supposed to happen right now. We're supposed to not be doing anything. It does. It does seem like it's supposed to be the slower time. But my mid, my last mid was. Well, that never goes. That that stays the same. It was seemed busier to me. Oh, okay. It it was busy, and there's always something. There's always a go around. There's always something that gets me into doing paperwork at two in the morning. Mm mm. No. I just, man, it's been driving me nuts lately. The mid, I got to start getting out of them. I got to mm. trade out. I can't do it anymore. You should be able to do that more often next year. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, anyway, it was a nice break and holiday. And now we're getting into December where we should be slow or not. We're just going to keep on trucking. All right. Shall we begin? Yes. Okay. Ready. Since OB-256, about a year ago, <laughs> we have a ton of new patrons. We have actually more sitting in the inbox that are not on here that we'll do on OB-258. Welcome to the new patrons in the show listeners here, Mike Sierra, Delta Delta, Papa Delta, and Alpha Bravo. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is new in the show supporter tier. He moved up from the show listener tier, along with Juliet Bravo and Mike Mike. And we have two new showmakers, Echo Foxtrot and Delta Lima. Patrons get exclusive access to our live video stream every week, like right now. They get to see us, our faces, recording <laughs> via YouTube. <laughs> they get early releases. Yesterday, they got access to our store items that will be out by now. Our new shirts and some merch. They get a discount and free shipping. If you want to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing bases. And if you haven't done a review lately or you are new to the show, hit subscribe or follow. So our episodes are waiting each week and hit five stars and type up a review for us. We may read it on the show. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Reviews and announcements. Reviews. Mm, you want the review? All right. <laughs> I love these titles. Keep them coming, guys. The best. Girls. This review is titled. I think it's a little misleading, but we'll take <laughs> it. The the best. Oh, did I spell Limburg wrong? I did. Wait, you, what do you mean you? Oh, you wrote that? I put it in the on the banner. Oh. It's, I left an H out. Mm, oh, I see what you're talking about now. The, okay. Anyway, it's titled The Best Aviation Podcast Since Lindbergh's. <laughs> Five stars, naturally. That should go without saying. I think we'll just cease to say that. Sort of just redundant. <laughs> <laughs> Information as vast as a sinner's airspace. Knowledge as deep as the sleep of a sinner controller. <laughs> Humor as dry as a Carolina basement. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Uh, is that a s analogy? Simile. Anyway, and a vocabulary as well as limited as a sixth grade dropout. <laughs> we, yeah, you can tell we, we don't really value uh, <laughs> a high vocabulary. Our H and AG use their experience as controllers and pilots as well as their natural <clears throat> chemistry to answer questions and help us be better citizens of the national airspace system and life in general. Appealing to pilots and non-pilots alike, it's worth listening to a few newer episodes to get into the rhythm, and then you'll be hooked. I don't think Lindbergh actually had a podcast, but this is literally, literally what I look forward to on a Monday. 
Uh, Lindbergh did have a podcast. It was probably, it was the first aviation podcast. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, I think the Wright brothers might have had one too. I don't remember what that one was called though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Pugsley the Cat. Pugsley the Cat. <laughs> Pugsley the Cat. My brother's dog's name is Pugsley, so that threw what me off. What is that from? I don't know. Is Pugsley a character name from an old TV show? Pugsley the Cat. Maybe not. The aristic- Aristocrats? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> Just say it. Pugsley Adams. Pugsley Adams? Mm. Adams family, yes. Pugsley, Pugsley and Wednesday were my brother's dog's names. I think uh, those are both characters. Pugsley and Wednesday, the dogs. Uh, all this right. We, <laughs> thank you, Pugsley the cat. Yes. <laughs> uh, patron Alpha Juliet Sierra sent a note. Hey, guys, I just wanted to thank you for all you do. I passed my instrument check ride today. Congrats. And couldn't have done it without all I've learned listening to the podcast. Well, congrats. That's a big deal. Glad the show was helping you along the way. And patron Mike Golf passed his CFII check ride. For those of you who don't know what that means, certified flight instructor dash I is instrument. Double I is what we call it on the show. They can now teach students their instrument portion of training. That's very good. Very cool. Uh, we do not have a new Charlie Alpha segment. We're going to move right in today to... Timely feedback. Timely feedback. All right, there are two of these. The first one's audio, and you are injured. You shall do number one. <laughs> number one. <laughs> From SGAC, patron, Sierra Echo. Some All right. Audio. In listening to OB-256, I found myself thinking differently about how I would handle the circling approach that was discussed, particularly in the case of circling to the opposite end of a runway due to unfavorable winds, with the ceiling at something like 1,500 feet AGL at an uncontrolled airport. First, I would only make the decision to cancel IFR before the final approach fix and while I was still talking to the approach of the overlying center controller. If the airport is in sight, if conditions are comfortably VFR with little risk of ending up back in the clouds, then I would likely cancel IFR so as to not forget once I am on the ground. If, however, the conditions were sketchy, if there was any chance that I would end up stumbling back into the clouds, then I would completely mentally commit to a circling approach under instrument flight rules. Said another way, I would not continue a circling approach to a lower altitude in marginal conditions, then cancel IFR when below the clouds, and then fly the pattern VFR. If I do end up back in the clouds, I am an aviation's equivalent of no man's land, and I have no protected airspace and no clear path to safety. If you commit to the circling approach and then run into trouble, the clear path to safety is a turn towards the airport and execution of the published missed approach. In practical terms, you can still just fly the pattern if you can see the runway and land on the other end. You just have to remember to cancel IFR. Added a little bit on our message there. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, he added. So I'm a believer in an early commit to one plan or the other with a bias towards staying IFR if there is any doubt about the weather or airport conditions. Yeah, I think that's a great plan. I think having this, just having a plan is, you know, knowing that, hey, this could be a thing. This is what I'm going to do. And then we can, you can adjust off of that. But I, I love it. I like this, you know, tendency to lean towards staying IFR. Um, because you're right, especially once you've canceled in your VFR and now you got to go back in the clouds, mm. especially if you're flying a, <clears throat> something fast moving. It just, uh, Yeah. That's less than ideal. So before or during your approach briefing, <clears throat> if you find yourself in a situation where you, where you will have to circle, this is the type of thing you need to think about. Compare it to the active current weather and where you are and what your plan is on arriving at this airport. And in Sierra Echo's words, hey, if he, he figures it out, makes that decision if he's going to stay IFR for the entire approach before the final approach fix. That's a great place to do it. Yeah. So 
from a controller's perspective, um, most controllers, if we're talking about non-towered fields, unless we've had a recent Pi rep, or for whatever reason, are familiar that day with what the weather is, controllers are not going to be there. If you cancel the likelihood of them looking and seeing you circling and, and thinking, Oh, he's circling. Oh, the weather seems kind of sketchy for that. That, that thought is not happening in most controllers heads. Um, so don't, if don't expect, if you do that and you have to go back in the clouds the, that the controller is going to be on it right away. There is going to be a period of, uh, what, you know, not you canceled IFR, you know, right. I don't, I don't understand what's happening. So just, just be, just keep that in mind that it's, you're going to be starting all over basically. Mm. Yes. And if you stay IFR, you're going to have a tag. You're still going to have a tag. It's going to be much he. They're still thinking about you because you haven't yeah. canceled yet. Like yeah, the strip is right in front of them. Yeah, you're not gone out of their brain. When when you cancel Airborne, now we've en- endorsed it for years, but it is amazing how quickly we forget who you are. You yep. could call us back probably within a minute. I will have no idea who you are. No. No idea. If the strip isn't in front of me when an airplane starts talking, they're, they're new business. Yes, exactly. So gone. You're yep. out of my head. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra Echo, for sending audio. Great yeah. point. Yep. Number two from Patron Golf, Romeo Bravo, Patron GRB here. The magic cassette adapter that allowed playing your CDs in your car was actually pretty simple. We talked about this in the after show. Yeah. First, a little background. The tape player works by passing a tape that is coated with ferric oxide over a small coil in the playback head. The magnetic sound patterns in the ferric oxide create small electrical currents in the coil that are in, that are then amplified and played through a speaker. All right. The Magic Cassette Adapter contained a tiny little coil, which, when inserted into your cassette deck, aligned exactly with the playhead, playback head. The coil connected to the headphone jack on your CD player and the sound impulses from your audio CD through the coil created the same type of impulses in the playback head as did a tape. Now you know. Wow. It's still magical. <laughs> I, st- I mean, I get it. I get it. <clears throat> but I don't... I get what's happening. I just don't understand how that... I need like the Mark Rober version, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I need it broken down. It's an amazing piece of technology. You need two things now that you probably couldn't find. You might be able to find them on eBay. Yeah, you need something to play a tape, yeah. and then you need this device. But these were throwaways. These were these would have got tossed with all your tapes when you moved to CDs or MP3s or whatever you did. But nobody's got these laying around. So, uh, well. <laughs> So when I started taking the bug apart, mm. they're in the boot for for those of you outside of the United States. The boot in the boot uh, was a duffel bag full of cassette tapes, and I've been instructed when I, if I continue this project, that I shall have a tape player mm. in the car. Mm. So yeah, it'll just be a a trip to nostalgia every time you get in this thing. The sooner you can procure this ancient piece of technology, you need to get it. <laughs> They're not being <laughs> There's made. There's still it. one in there. It probably works fine. Oh, I'm sure it does. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Golf Romeo Bravo. We got a few responses about that. That was the simplest one I could find. I like it. Thank you. All right, moving on. All right, this week's show topic is brought to us by patron Juliet Papa Mike. I broke this down into paragraphs. Let's try to address these as they go along without getting too far ahead, because I think we hit most of the stuff as we go, and then some blurb at the end. Okay. How about that? All right, I'll get it started. 
Hello, RH and HE. Thank you for both for an awesome show and fantastic content week in and week out. You're welcome. <clears throat> I'm a relatively new instrument pilot based north of the Empire State Bravo and went up this past weekend with an instructor, instructor in actual instrument conditions to knock off the dust off of my approaches and holds after a few months hiatus given a new addition to the family. So <clears throat> pause there for a public service announcement. Good for you for doing this. A lot of people talk about doing it and then they don't actually do it. So you got your rating. You're planning on having some more flexibility with your flying. But a couple months goes by as does in, over time your confidence erodes of all the training you just did. So instead of just going back up and crossing your fingers and doing your regulatory requirements for IPCs or such, you went up in actual clouds with an instructor and, and did approaches. So that's awesome. I support that 100%. Yeah, you know, I, I was just thinking about uh, the the long periods I would go in between flying, especially where you were actual IMC or where you like low IMC especially, mm -hmm. and then that first flight you got in and how fortunate we were to always have two pilots. Mm -hmm. And you just always kind of felt like there was a backup. Because if you haven't flown in a few months – and you go punching into the clouds at 400 feet in a bank, okay. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a turn, you better, you know, hopefully you've knocked the rust off or mm -hmm. you're, you're prepared or you have an autopilot. I mean, something because yeah, it is, it doesn't take much um, mm -hmm. and you get rusty quick. Mm -hmm. So good on you for doing that. The plan was to take off from our home class Delta airport, fly a few approaches at a series of towered and untowered airports before proceeding home. Reminder, this was an actual IMC. We all, as controllers, know those days when they happen, there's perfect non-icing IMC conditions. It's cloudy. They can find themselves intentionally in clouds to get practice, but high enough ceilings where you can do approaches and, and do real world work. It's This is what it's all for, right? Uh, my instructor and I struggled on how to build our flight plan given we were planning on doing a few missed approaches and holds as part of this practice. We filed our first destination and listed our next destination as an alternate. Hmm. Then filed subsequent flight plans from the alternate to the next destination with our following destination as the next alternate. Finally, we filed a flight plan from, from that alternate back home. In each of these flight plan remarks, we noted that we were performing a series of practice approaches. All right, pause. <laughs> The I don't know if this ever got said on the show. If it did, I'm we're sorry. I don't think we ever endorse this practice. The alternate field that you file on your flight plan is not seen by air traffic. And even if you did have to go missed in no radio conditions, it would be very difficult for us to get that information from flight service, if not impossible. So I don't that's a very creative way to try to file, but it would be extremely confusing for the controllers. And we would have no idea what was going on. That that doesn't really make sense to us from a practical application standpoint on ATC. Yeah. Unless it's in the remarks. Next airport is. But I'm guessing with all the with the requests in there for practice approaches, that's not going to fit in there. You want to pick up the next paragraph? Uh, let's see. There were no issues. There were no issues with our first three airports. Upon going missed, we were told to say intentions and subsequently got vectored around for new approaches at the next airport with no problems. Based on the way... Okay, so... Uh, the, the say intentions part is because they don't... They didn't know where you were going. Um... So, <laughs> yeah, so based on the way you filed it, uh, the no problems thing was that you, you said, well, we want to go, I'm assuming, you, they said, say intentions, we want to go do an, this approach at this airport. Okay. A and they didn't know that. Right. Right. It's a coincidence. It's, uh, we just don't want you to walk away thinking that the way you did this alternate thing was the reason there was no confusion on those first three is because the controller working to you likely had one strip in front of them 
and they didn't know what was next. They asked you and you told them nothing changed. They didn't, they didn't go look for that new <laughs> flight. No. It was just a massive coincidence. You're like, man, that worked. This whole alternate thing. All right. This they is, understand. Yeah, yeah. No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of work going on in the background to amend it. Probably. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes there is, there are problem flight plans and they are frequently these practice approaches where pilots have filed numerous airports on one flight plan. And usually once they cross the first boundary, so you get the first handoff and let's say you started at Duke and then you get handed off to triad and you do an approach at triad after that first approach and you t drop off the scope your flight plan is gone. Let's say you had three more airports to go to. Now gone. everything is either a manual handoff or I have to make a new flight plan. We're going to get to that. Okay. All right. Keep going with the complexity part. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the complexity came when we got our, got to our third airport destination and performed a touch and go before flying the missed approach. We entered the hold and were asked what we'd like to do. We told him we'd like to proceed to our fourth airport, which he didn't know what it was. We were asked if we had a, a flight plan on file. We said we did, and that the fourth airport was an alternate to the plan we were on. We were roughly told that we don't see alternates. Okay, so there we go. Uh, you guys have to tell us what you're doing. Uh, we'll have to see if we can figure this out. Yeah, so... Uh, they are they're working in the background to make this work and they're super uh, confused yes and now this is probably like <laughs> this is the first time that they've realized oh wait there are all these flight plans in here but it doesn't make sense because the f plan a ends at this airport mm -hmm. and then the next flight plan starts at another one and there's no there's no indication to the controller of how did we get to this next airport? All right. Because the alternate isn't on there. Okay. All right. Uh, so we got a hold. Expect further clearance in 30 minutes. Oh we, pro we proceeded to do <laughs> loops before getting a flight plan back about five minutes later. All right. That felt purposefully inconvenient, but managed to perform the rest of our approaches and return without incident. This brings to mind a few questions. Should we have tried to file this any other way? Would it have been better to have a separate flight plan for every leg of the flight, ignoring the alternates entirely? All right. This does depend. The alternate thing, just please don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> for this method, I have to be very careful how I say this. For the purposes of what you were trying to accomplish, that did not work. You thought it was working. It didn't work. And you mentioned the complexity started when you did your first touch and go. That's the first time you dropped off the scope. Your flight plan falls out. It's gone. Yep. So when you come back up for air, they're like, you're thinking, oh, man, this has been working great. We're going to go to airport four. And they're like, well, we only saw a airport. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> we have no idea. So how do we do this? They asked that the answer depends. If you stayed on the same airspace all day, filing a flight plan from A to B to C to D, and then to E or fifth airport would have worked. If you're leaving the airspace, filing a separate flight plan to come back would be helpful, but not necessary. And that was what AG was just saying. If you went from Duke to Triad, as soon as you land and try it or fall off the radar, it's gone. So going back, we're going to get to this. There's ways to communicate that with the controllers to keep that flight plan uh, going. We're, we're going to get there. Okay. Uh, a, a note on that. The military is probably the only ones that do this. What the de depart or the delay? With the delay, that's right. the only way it stays in there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And the controllers would have to go in and put a delay. And I, honestly, I wouldn't. I don't remember the keyboard entry for that. I'm well, going to guess most shows. controllers don't. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. So if there's not a delay, even if there's a second airport in the flight plan, as soon as you're off the scope at the first one, it thinks you're done. We can manually hold that alive by suspending the track. Yes. But you have to make sure that's communicated that, 
they'd have to know what was going on. And the flight plan they got was you going to this airport A. Full so they stop. would have no they would have no reason to do that. Right, unless you told them. All right, you want to get number two? Okay, number two. Does ATC really not see alternates in a flight plan? Uh, why are we even <laughs> filing them if that is the case? <sighs> okay. You know what? I don't know. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for lost combo purposes, uh, we don't know where your alternate is. Mm-mm. And I don't think, even if we tried and called flight service... They would have no idea. I've tried this. Yeah. I've tried to get this information from them. They don't know. Okay. It's gone. It's for planning purposes. Alternates are for planning and to comply with the regulations for weather. You have to have an alternate. You have to be able to get there, fly around, and fly afterwards under IFR for X amount of time. That's in the regs. That's what the alternate's for. Right. Beyond that, ATC doesn't see it. We would have no way to know. So hopefully you don't go Nordo on a mist because we, <laughs> we're just going to be guessing. We have no idea where we're going. We could try to find out, but it's going to be impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know how we would find out if flight service can't tell us. Yeah. There's no. All right. Number three, did something change given we did a touch and go at an airport versus mist? I, we, I think we addressed that. Yes. You fell off the radar. You went off of the screen and the FDIO, the NAS drops you. It's, it's like you just landed. It's done. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Patreon, a uh, patron, Juliet, Papa, Mike. All right. I wrote up a little summer here. All right. The flight plan could have been one flight plan. And I actually have seen this recently from other airspace to ours to a third airspace. And it was filed with kilos in front. Totally obvious that you want to do something at that airport, in my opinion, or at least we're going to ask. So it was Duke, Triad, way up north, Lynchburg area. So we're going to go from Duke airspace to ours into Center's airspace. And it processed. It worked. They, really? The controller kept it alive by doing a track suspend. Okay. So when they And they communicated with the tower. Uh, that's another part that's going to get too deep in the weeds for the subject matter here today. But depending on where you're going, a non-towered airport could really screw things up, especially if your original flight didn't include a clearance limit that went through all those airports. This is when the filing of all those airports would have been the best thing to do. Then your clearance was accurate. If you were Nordo and you were IMC, we could at least logically draw the next conclusion that you're going to go to the next place on your on your flight plan. It's not mm -hmm. an alternate field. It's the next place in your flight plan. Hopefully the weather would allow you to get out of IMC and land. But all right, I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole, but um, go ahead. Sorry. Do you have something to say there? No, go ahead. All right, so doing a low approach would keep it alive. If you're going to do a touch and go, make sure the controller knows before you switch to the tower or advisor that you want to continue to the remaining airports on your flight plan. This is assuming that you filed multiple airports in a flight plan with remarks that says practice approach at each airport. That would have worked. That would have worked totally fine. They can make sure the flight plan doesn't drop when you go below radar. If you filed one flight plan, your clearance limit should be the airport of departure. So clear to the Duke Airport. As filed, Duke, Triad, let's just use this example that I saw recently, Lynchburg, Charlottesville, back to Duke. Okay. There's no reason why we cannot clear you that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, it would be confusing for us in lost comms, but lost comms would always be confusing for controllers because we really don't know exactly what you're going to do. It's an emergency. But a case could be made and logic say, all right, they went missed at the first airport on here. I'll bet you they try to go to their next airport. And you might. You might very well try to do that. Yeah. Is that fair? I think so. So during your planning for this flight, uh, especially if the airports are really close together, be careful that you do have an alternate airport that you can comply with the regulations and allow for an, an approach. Usually the, the minimums have to be <clears throat> in order to allow you to get through the clouds. So the clouds have to be a little bit better. So if you're doing five approaches and it's 400 foot overcast in one area, I don't have the reg in front of me, but you're probably going to have to go outside of that local area to find better weather to be able to comply with the alternate requirements, correct? Yeah, probably. Which 
you're not going to find a reg that walks you through that because you're going from point A to B to C to D to E and, and a big circle. So use some common sense and try to use good judgment to figure out, all right, if this all goes south, this is fun. We're getting good currency here, but we have to be able to get down eventually. So we need to find an alternate that's outside of this comfort zone here. Right. Sorry, I talked a so lot there. It, if we, going back to the track suspend so that you don't drop out, are we getting a count for that? If you track suspend somebody before they do the approach. I don't know. So especially if they're IFR and they're doing practice approaches, like it, we get bonus points, right, for complexity. Correct. And if I track suspend you, especially going into triad, I don't feel like you even populate in the arrival list. If GSO was written in the scratch pad, uh -huh. it will appear as an arrival in terms of count. And an IFR counts the same regardless of an approach. Okay, so, so um, even when it's track suspended and it will go to that runway arrival list. If all they were doing was a touch and go at our towered airport, when they mm -hmm. pop back off, they would, it would still be in the system. We wouldn't have to track suspend it here. We would have to track suspend, suspend it going into coat factory or okay. prison airport. Okay. But I don't believe it would be required, but that raises a good point. I, that you may not, but we'd still be able to see you. The count at that point, make sure the scratch pads are generated properly to try to get that, but that's kind of secondary to the our intent would be to keep you all Well, sure, I know. I just, I'm thinking if we did this for everybody, <laughs> we wouldn't have any traffic. The right. system wouldn't see us as having traffic, you know. Right. You guys are doing approaches. When, you know, you're not doing any practice approaches. What are you doing? Are you right. Duke now? <laughs> <laughs> i like that um all right so here's the summary we don't see the alternate you can do multiple flight plans in and out of airspace but you don't have to you can file a flight plan with airports as places along your route and put in the remarks practice approaches at each airport that should help them the controller keep your flight plan alive coordinate in the event that you're going to a non-towered airport to keep it alive um, but to communicate a, much more transparently than what happened with you. They had no idea you wanted to do this. You thought they did. They did not. Um, it also, filing that way, will allow it to progress to the next facility if you're leaving that airspace. That's, I can't think of why that shouldn't work. If the controller is aware of it and can see it on the flight plan, because you shouldn't show up as just an arrival strip. The flight data person should make sure they don't remove all that. They, You might see an arrival to... No, no, it won't. If you're just filed this triad as a fix, it'll show it as an overflight. Yeah. It would have to be the destination for us to only get an arrival strip, That's which right. doesn't show all that flight plan stuff. So file multiple airports. It should work that way. If it doesn't, <clears throat> let us know. But that should work. Yeah. Right. That should okay. always work. It, it 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 should at least work in conveying your intentions versus so automation wise, it's easier for us if you file a separate pl separate flight plan for each airport because then it's just no brainer for us. Automation wise, it, it's super easy. We just give you a new code and off you go. But I I don't know what you're doing next necessarily i'm not over there looking at the proposals exactly and going oh, does this does this inbound guy have an outbound no nope. that's not going through my head so um i i'm i'm gonna have to ask you like if you don't say anything and you just have a flight plan into this airport i'm thinking you're full stopping yep so if you don't say anything when you check in or tell me hey we're doing an approach then we're going to pick up our outbound it's going to be, you know, the back and forth of trying to figure out what you're doing. Yeah. I, and for what you guys wanted to do that day, I think one flight plan would have been the most appropriate because you had no intention of stopping and getting out and, and starting over again. The clearance originally from your origination airport would have been accurate and legal. There sh it would minimize a lot of the confusion that way. So don't let this part discourage you from doing what you're doing. 
um, because this is awesome. I wish more pilots would go out. You, you, look, I would love it if it was an instructor that you had with you. A double I, that's great. That's like triple insurance. you got someone who can teach you, and they're more experienced, and they know what's going on in the clouds. But don't be afraid to have this be someone else who's instrument qualified and knows what they're doing in the right seat, another pilot. It could be another club member. It could be a friend who's a pilot. Somebody to walk you through this. It doesn't... It, it takes away a, a level of safety and redundancy with another experienced pilot, but it's still you getting out there and getting real world experience in the clouds. Yeah. So. Do we beat that horse? I think so. Good question though. I, I'm glad this came up cause I, I don't think we've beat this <clears throat> horse. No, I don't, not specifically in terms of multiple airports like this. So yeah. Sweet. Excellent. All right, moving on. Feedback time. Feedback. This is perfectly appropriate. From SCAC patron Mike Sierra. Send some audio. Greetings, RH and AG, and all the OBers out in the Penguiniverse. This is Original Mike Sierra coming to you from smack dab in the middle of Wisconsin. And this week, I thought we'd talk about vacation. But more specifically, the dreaded horror that is coming back to work from vacation. As most of you don't know, I am a delivery driver for the biggest brown box company in the world that makes lots of right turns and beeps their horn a lot. <laughs> And for me, coming back to work is rough. Uh, just dragging an anchor. It feels like I'm dragging an anchor, brain fog. What street am I on? Where am I going next? And then if, especially if I was crazy enough to take two weeks in a row off, uh, they may have to give me directions on how to get, how to get to work in the morning <laughs> because I just, my brain isn't there. And I've long time been a proponent of uh, proposing that, uh, people coming back from vacation should be on a, like a work hardening program where like first day you only have to work a couple hours, get you back in the groove a little bit. Next day, you maybe work three to four hours till about by the end of the week, you can finally back be full time. And then, you know, you'd be back in the game. But anyways, I was just seeing how, how rough is it for you guys as controllers getting back into it, how I'm mentally back into the game and how that works. Have a great day. You guys keep up the good work. Talk to you later. Stir me out. Thank you, Mike Sierra. Great question. Uh, first of all, I have the utmost respect for mm -hmm. for what you do. I I I always admire the efficiency. You know, the drive for efficiency for from this from this company specifically, but others like it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the right turn thing, I try to implement that in my daily life as much as I can. Mm, interesting. <laughs> interesting. If I can avoid sitting at a light, <clears throat> making a left turn, and just do a couple right turns. So when I delivered pizza, I did this all the time. Lots of right turns. Anyway. Okay. okay. Settling back in after vacation. I get to work, especially if I get there first day back. I've been gone maybe, you know, a week and a half, two weeks or something. And I, I have an R. Now, going to the tower, it's fine. Whatever. It's an extension uh, of vacation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time. That's how you ease back into work. You go to the tower. If you come back and you're in a radar slot and you walk in and it's like planes all over the scope, I go uh, to the soup. I'm like, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. This Maybe is, if I could just sit plan. on flight data for a while. Is there a trainee that can plug in? I'll yeah. watch them work. Yeah, is there someone more <laughs> proficient? <laughs> uh, sometimes you don't get that, though. Mm -mm. You come back and just get thrown to the wolves. Now, I was gone for a year once. Mm. Okay, they gave me a week to to catch up on the stuff that had changed in the books. And then I got a couple hours on clearance, a couple hours on ground, and a couple hours on local, and check rides on those. Right. Plugged in with somebody, right. Watching yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, you were recertifying. Right. And then in the radar room, I got 10 hours, I think, each position plugged in with somebody. Mm -hmm. 
but man, after a year, I had, I feel like I had no idea what was happening downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> there had to be someone plugged in and I was constantly asking questions. Right. And stuff had changed. So it was like, yeah, it was tough. You definitely need that spool up time. And so I I wouldn't be afraid to say, hey, just keep an eye on me. You know? Yeah. Yep. And the odds of you plugging in on radar and being busy on your first day back are much higher because it's the middle of the day. We come back at usually on three o'clock on our first day back. Yeah. That's the middle of normal traffic where we'd have two sectors open and something going on where, man, there are a couple scenarios, ILSs and tons of practice approaches. It would be a bad time to sit down and sort of reacclimate, but you have to, we just have to sit down and figure it out. Uh, the, my worst nightmare would be to go to the tower and have it be actual, there's some things going on. A runway is closed and I got pattern traffic and a bunch of times to hit. I have zero rhythm in the tower as it is, yeah. let alone after a week That's of brain inactivity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would probably, the problem would slow down to the point of inefficiency. That would be me getting back into it. This, all right. Can you imagine coming back <laughs> from a long vacation? Let's say the whole airport was open, right? Uh, and you come back and you work ground on a 3-2 operation. Nope. <laughs> nope. Not if I'm in charge. We're going right over to a parallel immediately. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah. I So I'm driving in. I see the big flag. I pass. And it's, you know, it's the wind's coming strong out of the northwest. I'm like, yeah, one more day of vacation <laughs> might not be well, bad. <laughs> Calling to work. Hey, are we on three two? Yep, we're on three two. All right, I'm gonna be there in ten minutes. Go to the two threes. Yep, yep. It's yep. not happening. If you want me to come in, I'm holding you hostage now. It shouldn't take you too long. Once if there's actual traffic and you're busy and you got covered up the second you came back, it's not gonna take long before someone else realizes that you're not ready for this, right? <laughs> and removes you from position. <laughs> Get him out of there. Get, get, what's happening? Get him out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or you figure it out. So, good question. We yeah. didn't know what to do today. After two weeks of no recording, we're staring at all of our equipment going, now what do we do? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, two weeks, that's it. Uh, so, basically, a two-week vacation, you come back, you're like at the level of a standard supervisor. <laughs> Great question. Moving on. <laughs> Number two. From patron Bravo Sierra. Do you want this one or do I get this one? Uh, go ahead. You should... All right. Dear opposing bases, it's been a while since my last confession. I mean, feedback. Forgive me. I like that. Yeah. I've listened to all of your podcasts and I don't remember this being covered. But since my iceberg has been full of penguins since 2013, I may have forgotten that this was covered. My question. Why? And to be more specific, on an IFR clearance, are we told climb and maintain a specific initial altitude and then expect our filed cruising altitude 10 minutes later? Usually, although I've gotten expect final altitude in five minutes. What is the point in the specific time delay? Seems archaic these days. Thank you both. Bravo, Sierra. I think you're in the chat room today. I answered this question a long time ago when it came in, but now we're going to get to it on the show. This goes back to how a lot of rules are meant for IFR, specifically non-radar or no radios, broken, unable to communicate. This is part of a flow of your routing and your altitude selection. If you are no, no radios or found yourself not being able to communicate with air, air traffic, one of the altitudes in the go highest <clears throat> choice selection is the altitude you are expected to fly. Our clearance is typically at the triad or really any airport, satellite, non-towered airport. An initial altitude that's below four or 5,000 feet above the ground to prevent you from becoming an issue for an overflight. And an expect altitude 10 minutes later, that's what we use here, of your filed altitude. Very rarely is it something different than that. So if you take off, you say hello, boop, you go... Nordo, 
you're in the IMC, you can't see the ground, you can't continue VFR like the regs say to do if you are able to continue VFR. And now you have to start figuring out what do we do? One of the altitudes you have to choose from is the expected altitude and you should initiate a climb to that altitude. Yep. That's, that's the basics behind that one. Yep. 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 It's all for, it's all for lost combo. Mostly. Yep. Um, then I got dinged on a check ride once for not writing down my departure time. Ah, or for not knowing it. Right. So we took off 20 minutes later. He said, what was our departure time? I said, uh, 20 minutes ago. Yeah, I can't do math. Ago? He's like, no, wrong. <laughs> that time is also important for the route selection and when you shoot an approach in those scenarios where it's cloudy and you and your instructor are bored and want to talk about lost comm scenarios. This one will come up on the specifics of your flight plan, what, how much time you filed, where you're filed to, when can you begin the approach at the destination airport? Here's the air traffic unofficial answer. If you uh, flew all this way, no radio, and we were your destination, and we saw you begin a hold at an initial approach fix, that would cause a ton of confusion. We would not expect that. Even if it was what the regs say to do, we're expecting you to land, and we're going to clear a path. We're going to get out of your way, fly an approach, and get on the ground. Yeah, and for some reason you were 20 minutes early (laughs) and you held for 20 minutes. Oh, my God. At the final approach fix (laughs) into an air, like, especially a a busier place. And when I say busier, Mm. I mean like a class Charlie and more. Mm -hmm. People would be tearing their hair out. Yeah, because you're locking up the airport until you decide it's time to land. And by the way, we have no access to that piece of information either. Yeah, we don't even know what the time is. We have no idea what you're doing because we don't know what time you're supposed to be here. And let's be honest, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most GA that isn't carrying passengers with some fancy flight planning software is taking a guess on the performance. And yes, the EFBs will probably get you pretty close time-wise now because it's doing all the nav log for you and it's yeah, figuring it out. And but, everything. Yeah. but we're not we're not getting down to the minute here. Come on, guys. Yeah. No, no controller is sitting there <laughs> looking at the clock going, okay. He's going to start his approach in 45 <laughs> seconds. None. Zero. That is not happening. He's he's looking at the scope going, go away. <laughs> Get off of my scope. Land somewhere. I don't even care where. Just go away. You could land in my backyard. Just get down. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Great question, Bravo Sierra. You get number three now. Number three. All right. From patron Alpha Sierra. My plan was to fly VFR for a tour over the very famous Orange Bridge and then come back IFR and shoot the approach into HAF. Yes. Uh, the picture is below on the next page for you okay. to look at when you're, when you're right. discussing. I had flight following the whole way because Bravo clearance and <laughs> on my way back towards the airport, approximately where the red circle is outside of the Bravo, the conversation went something like this. Me. Fog City Approach, November uh, 1234, would like to head to Half Moon to shoot the approach IFR flight plan on file. ATC, November 1234, you want to pick up your IFR now? I could sense confusion in his voice as I rapidly approached his heavy departure corridor. <laughs> I won't be able to clear you for another 15 miles. Uh, paraphrased. Me, I can fly VFR until you can give it to me. Go look at the picture while before we go to the next part. So okay. you get an idea of what's going on here. You're going from the north of an arrival corridor to south of one. Okay. So you're going through finals or through a departure corridor. It could be the other way. that It could be departing that way. Uh, but you're going through a very busy and low Bravo. Oh, Half Moon Bay. Okay. Sector before you get to the other side where you can start an approach. So that, that picture is important. Okay, got it. Of, of your flow. All right, Let's I'm go. on board now. Okay, go ahead. All right, let's see, where was I? I can fly VFR until you can give me the clearance. Roger, cleared into the Bravo at 3,500. Remain VFR west of the highway. Let the next controller know you want the approach into Half Moon. Uh, 20-some miles and two handoffs later, I request the IFR Mm. flight plan and hear the cleared to Half Moon and an approach clearance. My question is this. Since I knew they probably weren't going 
to IFR me through the Fog City departures anytime quickly. Is this a case of giving them too much information and that I should have just requested the VFR Bravo corridor and set myself up on a downwind to the approach, then ask for the approach? Or is it possible this controller is just not used to obey to or asking for an IFR clearance in this very busy airspace? Anyway, this email is way really longer than anticipated. Thanks for reading. Okay. I think it's a combination. I think a combination of this. Um, you certainly could have just done the the approach or the uh, the VFR request and then done <clears throat> that later. Um, but I think you're right in in that they're not used to this. This is not a normal. It's out of the routine, right? So somebody that's sightseeing typically doesn't then also want to do a practice approach uh, on IFR actual IFR flight plan. So yeah, I think it's a little unusual, but. Um, you could just take this experience and next time you do that or in a similar situation, just say, yeah, I'm going to wait until I pick up my, you know, to pick up my clearance. Or you could say, you could lead off with, Hey, I have an IFR in there. Whenever it's convenient for you to give it to me, uh, you know, I can be VFR through the corridor or whatever. And they're like, cool, Roger that, uh, you know. I think you could, there's just so many options. Yeah. Another option would be to get to the other side of the busy road that you're crossing on the depicted VFR flyway, which is very detailed in this map. I think this is a terminal area uh, chart uh, that shows the route for these VFR uh, tour routes, if you will. Uh, wait till you get to the other side where it's obviously not on a final or departure corridor for the big uh, Orange Bridge Airport under the Sourdough Bravo, I think is what we call that on the show. Yeah. Uh, and then when you get to the other side, say, can I pick up a local IFR inbound to Half Moon Bay? It doesn't matter if one's on file or not. If they can clear you, all right, cleared to Half Moon Bay, it's going to be the same execution on the controller side as it would have been had you had this flight plan sitting there that they might not even have that. I don't know how far away you were. Yeah. This the flight plan could be sitting somewhere or got tossed because it timed out. Who knows? That doesn't matter, though, from our point of view. Once you get to the point where I can actually issue an IFR clearance, i.e. I have the appropriate separation, I can clear to that regardless of you having a, a flight plan on file. I have all your information already. I know what type of airplane you are. Um, I know where your destination is. They may ask you for fuel on board in an alternate, but okay. They're going to say clear, too. Yeah, give you an fix and clear for the approach. And looking on this map, awesome detail. Thank you for showing us your flight path. It looks like they immediately put you on a downwind track and got to the correct side of the arrival side of the airport so they can clear you to a fix and clear you for the approach. So from their point of view, waiting to the other side would have been just as effective as telling them beforehand two or three controllers ago. Probably more efficient. Just tell the last person, all right, I, I got through the mess. I'm ready for a local IFR. We're going to land here. Perfect. Yep. And I would yep. bet that happens a lot, specifically because of the weather there and the need to get through a very thin layer of IMC to land. That's probably very common there with that terrain there as well. So. Yep. Yep. Great question. Do I get the last one? I guess so. All right. From patron Charlie Mike, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. Hey, gents. All right, this was part of a longer email. Uh, we went back and forth a little bit. Uh, listener, since day one, back in March of this year, I quit my job in the motorsports industry to pursue flight training full-time. It was always my dream to fly professionally, but my own life got in my way. Thankfully, just like Mav in 1986, I never lost that love and feeling. Okay, nice. <laughs> Since March, I got my private certificate, instrument rating, and just passed my commercial ride a few weeks ago. Congrats. <clears throat> so that's within the year. Now I'm studying for CFI certificate, and I'll be doing my training at a Class Delta facility underneath the Sourdough Bravo. Hmm. hmm. Could be on the map we're looking at from the previous question. All right. They sent some audio that we are not going to play on the show. Uh, the audio was about a minute long. We may talk about it in the chat room, but uh, there's no way to make this pretty. The controller was a jerk and said some really 
quick and terrible things to a student pilot flying through their airspace. Mm. Yeah. Charlie Mike continues. Seems to me that regardless if she had a future in aviation, that the, the student pilot was a female, uh, recreational or otherwise, she departed that airspace emotionally stressed, unfocused, and in a much more volatile mental state than when she arrived. She quit her flight training the next day. Ugh. Which sucks, and I don't hold the controller responsible for that. Well, I do, at least partially, based on the audio. It certainly didn't help. Um, but imagine if her experience at that facility was, was more of a learning experience rather than a public humiliation over the airwaves. That's all I've got for now. Thanks for the pod, and best of luck on never-ending bathroom renovations and land cruiser builds. <laughs> and I wish I had a land cruiser. <laughs> Oh, All right, so cool. I put a public service announcement. We try to stay very positive on the show as much as possible, laugh, and when we na- when we need to get serious, talk about something we do. So I'm smiling, I'm laughing still because the show's been fun. But public news for controllers. You can make your point on frequency without demoralizing a student pilot. You don't if you have to go that route, you're the problem. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean, look, the, so there are people at our work that aren't that bad, but they frequently will give student pilots a hard time. Mm-hmm. And I just say, dude, you know, people weren't <clears throat> born and, and just the next day they become professional airline pilots. Right. These guys all have to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you know what? The most understanding people on the frequency to these situations are always the airline guys, mm-hmm. the professional pilots, because they've all been there. Yep. You start out not knowing anything. Mm-hmm. So we have to have student pilots. That is yep. just part of the job. And for us at Triad, that is a huge chunk of it. Yep. That is just what we're going to do. Imagine if the uh, control, the, the, excuse me, the pilots could react the way they're thinking sometimes about some of the things trainees say, even controllers that are certified. We do, we say things that are mistakes all the time. Yeah. Oh, and the relationship yeah. does not allow for us to get ribbed like that. Yeah. A pilot would never key up and make fun of air traffic without it being very obvious that they were joking. Right. For, for fear of some sort of retaliation. <laughs> controllers should feel the same way just because they're new and they made a mistake. It's not going to help if you're a jerk on the frequency, number one. And two, that's still a person. You still have to give them some respect. You may not like what they did and they may have exhibited a lack of knowledge somewhere, but I promise you when that tape gets played, if something happens to that airplane and your voice was the last one they hear on the TV, you're going to regret that. Big time. And you know what? If you, as a controller, like you said, there, you can get your point across. Um, but if you don't know what it's like to be in an airplane, okay, you there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on. And if you don't know what it's like to be totally just sunk i mean you are down the pipes Mm -hmm. and you're in an airplane not sitting in a comfortable chair in a (laughs) a comfortable room right um you really just need to give them a break and a student specifically without this you know the warm fuzzy blanket of a cfi next to them getting yelled at on frequency and no, and everybody knows that you messed up. That's a bad place to be. Yeah. And it shouldn't happen, period. That should not have happened. What happened on the frequency didn't even amount to a reaction. It, it shouldn't even have been a reaction, and it was. So I renew what I said. The controller's the problem in this scenario. Yeah, yeah. Period. So be nice. Hmm, that's too bad. Mm-hmm. All right, we do not have a new question of the week. Check out atcsax.com to find a great way to keep your headset free from dust and 
dirt. We have feedback prior to October 12th, 2022, right on the show, or we responded via email. I believe this was another 100% patron feedback show. Yes, it was. Thank you for that. If we missed your feedback, let us know. Check your spam. We respond from feedback at opposingbases.com. That's the address the questions or feedback should go to. AG, anything before we head to the chat room? No. Closing out episode 257 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Drop. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.